The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. Um, it's 10 o'clock, and we're going to wait just a few more minutes. People tend to log in here at the last minute, and then we'll start the webinar. Uh, you're all right now um, in, in muted mode, so um, if you need to ask a question or there's any troubles, just um, type your question or comment or suggestion in the questions box to the right of the screen, and I'll see it. And um, if it's a question for our presenters, uh, I'll read it back out loud at the end of the conference, uh, at the end of the webinar. And if something else is going wrong, I'll try very hard to uh, fix it. All right, so we're just going to wait here another minute as more people log in. All right. Um, all right. Actually, we've got quite a few attendees now, so I'm going to um, do an introduction, and then we'll get on with the webinar. Um, this is the third installment of the 2015 uh, MagTug webinar series. The Mid-Atlantic Geospatial Transportation Users Group, or MAGTUG for short, has been around for 10 years, helping transportation professionals stay abreast of advances in geospatial technology. We are an all-volunteer organization. All MAGTUG steering committee members donate their time to plan and carry out group, the group's informational events. And uh, transportation support companies donate resources such as meeting spaces, coffee and lunch at gatherings, and even today's GoToWebinar account was donated. Um, before we introduce today, the, today's speakers, uh, who are all volunteering their time to inform us of advances in training opportunities, please note the schedule of the rest of the 2015 webinar series. Um, August's webinar, um, August's webinar will be an online demonstration of disconnected editing of GIS data in the field by both Esri and Leica representatives. In October, Silvana Krupp of DellDOT will be showing us how to estimate potential roadway impacts from natural disasters using FEMA HAZIS MH and give us details on how the transportation specific HAZIS user group has been what has been up to. Um, we are still looking for a project or application to highlight for December's webinar. The topic is uh, the cloud, GIS, and government services. If you can volunteer your expertise to lead this webinar or know of someone or some accomplishment that fits this, this topic, please contact me, Janelle Bisaquino. I'm the first mugshot in the steering committee lineup on the MagTug website, which is magtug at wordpress.com. While you're there at the website, please take a moment to subscribe to our email list and join the National GIST discussion group. If you missed any of this year's or last year's webinar, they are all available to play or download on the site under meeting materials. Now on to today's webinar, Penn State's GIST online course. Beginning last year, 2014, Penn State's Masters of GIS online program began offering an online GIS for transportation course through the uh, College of Earth and Mineral Sciences, John A. Dutton E. Education Institute. The course has been developed to augment lectures with out-of-classroom academic experiences to facilitate interactions with professionals in the GIST field, as well as to provide exposure to hands-on real-world GIST project activities. Um, th this was done in, with help from the Pennsylvania Department of Transportation and the Susquehanna 
Economic Development Association's Council of Governments, or CETA COG for short. Um, the presenters are Don Keel, uh, Senior Principal Project Analyst for CETA COG, and instructor at the John A. Dutton E. Education Institute. Alexander, uh, no, I'm sorry, Emily Baxter, the learning designer for the Institute, and Jason Hollister, transportation GIS specialist for the Northeast Pennsylvania Alliance. Please take it away, um, John, or no, I'm sorry, Don, you're the lead. Okay, Janelle, thank you for the, the introductions. We gave you a mouthful of things to to cover, I guess, as the introduction. But we have a uh, essentially sort of a triple crown group of us today being timely with an analogy that we'll be talking to you about this uh, second version of the online GIST course. I'll cover most of the material, but Emily will also tell you a little bit about some of the uh, academic preparation, uh, particularly engaged scholarship that underlies the course, and Jason, who was one of the students in the course. Um, from NEPA Alliance up northeast of here will tell you about some of their um, development of a group project that we included in the course this time. Um, I'd also like to mention, I know that the, the presentation will be available online at the MAGTUG site, but if anybody would like uh, an actual uh, physical copy just of the slides, uh, please let us know. We'll be glad to, to accommodate you on that, and uh, we'll be having questions at the end this morning. As Janelle mentioned, this is uh, the second time around for this course that just wrapped up uh, in May. And this is an update on the presentation I gave at uh, the MAGTUC uh, meeting in Harrisburg last May. So there's a, a couple of slides that uh, essentially are the same material that was covered there, not very many. So if you were at that conference, if you'll bear with me a little bit, I do want to cover some of the same material. With this course this time, we decided to take a little bit different approach and try to put together the interests and resources of Penn State and PennDOT and CEDACOG. GIS for transportation is important for all three entities. I think that kind of uh, is evident. And there's also very few formal educational opportunities that exist nationwide for on-site uh, training or online courses, textbooks in the GIST field. And yet there are significant opportunities for practical collaboration, not just among these three groups, but some others, as you'll see, too. And this uh, orientation of the course is something that's kind of come together in a very interesting way that we'll tell you a little bit about today. Penn State has never had a GIS for transportation course until last year. There are a lot of uh, programs, 15 online programs right now in the Dutton uh, E-Education Institute. I won't go down each one of the bullet points here, but you can see uh, professional master's degrees, undergraduate degrees, graduate certificates in a lot of different areas. These are not all GIS programs. Um, I think it's safe to say that most uh, programs do incorporate GIS to some extent, but uh, you know, there's many different kinds of areas here, and the uh, uh, umbrella is growing, essentially, and we're very happy about that. The Institute presently has over 130 online courses, including MOOCs, and if you're not aware of what a MOOC is, it's a massive open online course, and these are uh, new initiatives for universities all across the country. Some of you may have taken those that are free or low-cost programs and can include thousands of people for any particular course as reaching the masses, so to speak, and Penn State's involved in those courses as well. So in uh, the 2014 and 2015 calendar years, we're getting close to 4,000 enrollments in the Dutton Institute. There have been over 3,200 program graduates to this point. A couple of other interesting uh, demographic items. The average student age is 35, so you can get an uh, idea that most people are coming back for additional schooling and maybe have graduated already and are looking at uh, a master's degree. And there's a significant emphasis uh, on military, homeland security type courses and programs in the institute as well. So about a quarter of the, the students are in the active military. 
Some of the links, as um, you'll see on this page and some others, are in the, the presentation, and you're certainly invited to have a look at those to get some further background that I don't take the time to cover today. The Masters of GIS program in the Dutton Institute has many different kinds of programs and courses. Here's a listing of some example online courses. I'm not going to talk about each one of them as well, but one thing I wanted to point out here is there is a challenge, I think, probably for just about every one of the courses that are available in that there's a natural um, tendency for some overlap among different courses with maybe the one, for example, that, that I've been teaching. And they all that's a good thing in a lot of ways, but you also want don't want to cover some of the same material maybe that's in other courses, at least to any significant extent. So one of the things I've tried to do is find sort of that sweet spot of having some things that do relate to other topics in general GIS um, without uh, you know duplicating things that don't need to be duplicated. The course itself, there's the, the number, it's Geography 497C, GIS for Transportation, Principles, Data, and Applications, I mentioned was offered for the first time last year. It's uh, good for three credits of graduate or undergraduate um, credit, and it lasts for 10 weeks. People do not actually have to be enrolled as a full-time student in the program to be able to take it, which I think is a, has been a good thing so far. And it, it's really designed more for GIST professionals, people that are already in the, P, in, in the field or that would like to maybe get more experience in the field or, or will be in the future. I mentioned that we just finished the second offering uh, for the spring two semester in early May, and that's primarily what we're going to talk to you about here. There's three major uh, objectives or main areas that we've tried to address in this course and the underlines are the most important parts um, right here. And we do cover concepts and technical approaches and tools, a lot on applications, and also do examine the organizational issues and challenges that usually are encountered in a professional sense or a professional setting in, in GIST. So there definitely is a uh, professional orientation to this that I think uh, comes out throughout the whole uh, class. And some of the learning outcomes are, are listed here as well um, that sort of support that as well. How do you design and develop successful GIST applications, for example? How do you um, incorporate new technologies? How does GIS for transportation fit into organizations? What are management strategies for that? And what sort of things would you uh, end up running into are all significant parts of the course. So these themes uh, build upon each other. And out of the, uh, the 10 weeks, the chart on the right there shows some of the uh, ways that these fit together where we start with uh, why GIST is important, some of the foundations like linear referencing, network analysis, we touch on data collection, specification, and management, and then get into applications, uh, and then leading into organizational factors. And activities are developed to go along with these. And then there are some course-long activities that I'll touch on more in just a minute that uh, really span the entire course. I, I wanted to put the chart in there on the right why GIST is unique, because there are a lot of overlap areas with other aspects of not only GIS, but other areas that aren't necessarily completely GIS, but there's many different uh, overlap areas. And so the students to this point that have taken the course have come from a lot of different backgrounds. And I think they've all gotten some uh, good information out of the class that helps it relate to their specific professional area. Some of the features are listed here. Um, I will be talking about some of these in uh, a bit more here coming up shortly. The first and the last bullets, though, are really the most important ones. Um, the philosophy of the Dutton Institute is really to try to promote as much um, inter-student connection and collaboration as possible, along with as much instructor interaction as can be supported from a distance. Obviously, there's no classroom where everyone gathers all at one time, so the virtual aspect of it is the most important part. 
and figuring out some ways to do that effectively has been something we've been trying to strive for since the beginning of this course. Um, there are a lot of things included in the course to facilitate that. I'll talk about some of them, but you can see the list there, a lot of online things. Um, visuals are very important to this course. Many collaborative tools are used. Writing skills are emphasized as well. And this all fits together to make kind of a comprehensive, uh, interesting way to approach the material, I think. Now, the second time around here this year, we have put some new content and uh, emphases in the course that really fall under the, the blanket of engaged scholarship. And Emily will be talking to you about that in just a minute. The, uh, one of the main places that Jason will tell you a bit more about is we had a course long set of real world group projects that kind of comes back to the audience, hopefully, that, that's hearing the webinar today, where we'll tell you a bit about how CEDACOG and PennDOT in the central and, uh, district offices were able to be involved in helping to develop the exercises and projects and hopefully we'll get some some good results that can be built upon out of that. Um, we have um, other things here in the four bullet points that I'll tell you a bit about uh, coming up in the next set of slides that we incorporated and one of the challenges I'll just point out in a course like this is to try to keep things up to date. The field is changing so rapidly, not necessarily the GIS nuts and bolts part of it so much for transportation, but there are so many new developments in technology and other affiliated areas that we've been trying to, I think, su uh, successfully address what are new things that are happening in the field if you're a GIST professional. So I want to tell you a little bit about some of these. First of all, we included more hands-on work this time around, uh, individual uh, exercises and then working together as a group on the, the three uh, projects that Jason will tell you a little bit more about. One thing that we did was to get a routable network from the South Carolina Department of Transportation. There are uh, some states, state DOTs, that have good quality routable networks and some that don't. One thing that was very interesting and attractive about using South Carolina is uh, they've been doing a lot with their network in terms of emergency management and hurricane preparation, for example. So one part of the exercises with this network was to take their actual hurricane evacuation routing network and do some simulated real world type um, exercises with it with network analysts with GIS and some other uh, sort of typical traditional things that you can do with network analysts and I think the students enjoyed that and got quite a bit of good background out of it as well. Another thing that was new this time was uh, the addition of guest experts. We conducted this through an online discussion forum, an asynchronous forum. We decided to start with this every other week this time and you can see the application areas where we identified a, an expert in the field, uh, a national expert to include in uh, addressing these particular topics and it was sequenced so that in general those topics fell during the same time that the lesson material covered that particular topic. Um, this is an example screen. We used the Yammer interface to be able to do this and this is the entry screen that the students used for uh, collaborating. Uh, right down at the bottom there, one of the posts um, addressed the expert and included a question and then the, student, the uh, expert would be able to respond however they wanted to, but people did not need to be online at the same time to be able to do it. Uh, the question could be submitted and the guest expert could respond later that day, that evening, the next day, however it fit into the schedule. So we had a good body of give and take for each one of these sessions when, when that happened. One thing that I did to prepare for this is to provide an introduction for the background of each guest expert. Um, in this case, the Vermont Agency of Transportation, which had a really interesting and significant um, event, emergency uh, response event for flooding that took place from Hurricane Tropical Storm Irene in 2011 it was very heavily uh, integrated, GIS was very heavily integrated in responding to that from VTRANS. 
So I provided some background about that and the uh, GIS manager at VTrans and provided some starter questions that the students could use to uh, begin the dialogue. And I think that was a good way to go about it to make sure that they had good background information. The guest experts themselves were also, um, I think, quite um, open and willing to share some of their resources and obviously their responses and opinions. But several of them posted um, presentations or videos or other resource materials that were relevant to the particular topic. You can see a couple of them right here. The small box there about the Ohio Indiana um, Unmanned Aircraft System Center, uh, that was one of the uh, uh, topics for new technologies. Um, you know, it was really uh, very well illustrated that particular that particular area and how it fits in the GIS for transportation. So uh, that was a, a really good um, response on the part of our guest experts. And sometimes it was a little bit bigger than that. The the larger box there, one of our experts provided. As you can see, there's some rules for creating a, su a successful career in GIS. And uh, I was very happy to see that. It was very well worth having that kind of resource available to the students. Another aspect that was new this time around was for students to uh, conduct a virtual field trip. They were certainly scattered all around the country, but one way to be able to get further background about GIS for transportation and then share it with the other students was to make what was recommended to be an on-site visit. I think there was one student that wasn't able to do an on-site visit, but an on-site visit for the most part to uh, an agency or a company that was involved in GIS for transportation, prepare notes and uh, conduct, first of all, conduct their interview, prepare notes, put together a summary paper and then a video presentation at the end of the course. These video presentations were shared with each other. The students could see each other's presentation. You can see the start screen or entry screen from the one of them right there for SEPTA. Uh, another person down in Virginia went to visit Virginia DOT. Another person in central Pennsylvania went to visit a private company called Avail that provides scheduling and routing software for um, transit systems. So people do not generally have any problem finding an appropriate entity to be able to interview and present the results to everybody else. And I think we were pleased with how that went this time as well. Okay, I'm going to step down for just a minute here and uh, turn this over to Emily Baxter and she will tell you a little bit more about the concept of an engaged scholarship and how some of what I've just talked to you about fits into the larger picture at Penn State and uh, how this all uh, integrates together. So, Emily? Great. Thanks, Don. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, as Janelle mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, I work as a learning designer for uh, GEOG 497C. And in that role, essentially, I help to put the course online for students. And I worked quite a bit with Don in talking about objectives for the course and effective ways to assess student learning as a part of the course. Um, these changes that Don has talked to you about were, were very exciting this time around. Um, Don is a, is a very dynamic instructor and is always thinking about ways to add new information to share with the students and new valuable experiences. Um, and one of the most most valuable um, was this uh, three world three real world group projects rather, and much of the rest of our presentation is going to focus on that component of the course. I wanted to speak to you a little bit about engaged scholarship at Penn State, which is um, a real underpinning of this group project idea. You can go ahead and go on to the next slide, Don. Here's a URL for Engaged Scholarship at Penn State if you're interested in learning a little bit more. Um, it is an important initiative and focus at Penn State. We can go on to the next slide. Out of classroom academic experiences that complement in classroom learning. So essentially engaged scholarship is the idea of being able to have students take what they're learning in a classroom, whether it be resident instruction or online, and be able to apply that in some sort of real world situation. Um, a common example of that might be what you may think of as service learning, where students may go out into the community as a part of their course um, and do some sort of work or project with a community agency. 
Um, Penn State is very committed to this idea. Um, the university created a Council on Engaged Scholarship uh, back in 2012, which is sponsored by three of the Penn State Vice Presidents. Uh, the university has a goal that by 2020, they would like to create the infrastructure for each Penn State student to have at least one meaningful engaged scholarship experience as a part of their academic experience at Penn State. So it's something that the university is very committed to. Um, creating that sort of experience in an online environment, as I will speak about in a few minutes here, does provide a unique set of challenges. When you have students who are connecting from across the country or in many cases around the world. Um, so I think that the online community at Penn State is just now really starting to think about creative ways that we can approach this engaged scholarship initiative and find ways to effectively implement it. Um, so Don is a real leader here with this course um, in including this. I think he did a really effective job of, of designing this experience for students um, and it's, it's one of the, the most effective ways I've seen in our institute of incorporating that engaged scholarship idea in student learning. We can go ahead to the next slide. Um, as you might imagine, uh, it required a lot of behind the scenes work. Um, I know that Don met for months before the course actually started um, to coordinate with the partner agencies and really clarify the focus and scope of the projects. If I look back at my notes and emails from Don, there are many, there were many iterations of the project uh, before the one that we ultimately settled on those three uh, projects that students worked on um, in groups. So it was a very thoughtful process. Um, a lot of a lot of thought went into what would work best for the students as well as for the agencies. Um, and I, I think we came up with three um, three great examples. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there were challenges to consider. Collaborating at a distance um, is always a challenge. In this case, we did have students who were connecting from various locations across the country. Uh, Jason will address in a few minutes uh, how the students were best able to address um, those challenges. Uh, from my perspective, uh, the issue of grading was an important consideration. These group projects were a large part of the course and it was important that we found meaningful ways to assess students' experiences and learning. Um, we ended up settling on three primary ways to assess students. Uh, students did assess not only their own contribution to the group, but also the contribution of the other students in the course. So they were able to provide um, confidential feedback to Dawn on how they felt everyone uh, contributed to that experience. Um, secondly, the students also created a project report, and this was done collaborative, collaboratively, excuse me, with different students responsible for different pieces of the report. Um, and the report is an excellent document. It provides a summary of the work that the students completed in all three of the projects. Um, they did a fantastic job of talking about the challenges that they faced with each project. Um, they talked about the ways that they approached those challenges and solutions that they found. And they were able to also provide recommendations to the partner agencies, which in some cases will um, continue to have legs and move forward beyond this course. And these are all um, pieces that Jason and Don will talk about some more in a few minutes. Um, finally, we wanted students to be able to reflect reflect as a part of this focus on engaged scholarship on how this real world experience that they had um, really did connect to um, the learning that was a part of the course. And so they did complete a reflective paper where they were able to make those connections between the course learning and this, um, and this project. You can go on to the next slide. Um, we really felt that incorporating this engaged scholarship component was very important. Um, it definitely adds rigor to the academic experience when students can directly apply what they're learning in a course to a real world situation. And as Don noted early in his presentation, nearly all of our students in the MGIS and GIS certificate programs are adult learners. And research has shown time and time again that adult learners especially highly value practical experiences. So when they can take a course and, and learn 
learn things that they can take right into their their jobs and their career aspirations. That's a very meaningful experience. So those are the reasons that Don really wanted to incorporate um, these projects as a part of the course. There were many benefits. Students did gain a lot of real world practical experience, which as I said is a very valuable element to a course. It did add rigor for them to be able to apply their learning directly right as the course was going on. Um, the partner agencies found real value in having this work completed by students. Um, and as I said, Jason will talk more about, and Dawn will talk more about how these projects will live on beyond um, this iteration of the course. Uh, this was our first try, our first attempt at doing something like that. Um, we learned a lot along the way in terms of things that work well, um, as well as things that maybe didn't work as well as we had hoped and other solutions that might be possibilities. Um, and so we take all of that feedback from the students and the partner agencies and Don and myself and um, we're always very reflective about it and, and use that as we plan for future offerings to make the course uh, the best that it can be. So that's a little bit of the, the behind the scenes um, academic background to uh, this real world group project component of the course. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Jason Hollister, who was one of the students that participated um, in the course. Actually, Emily, I'm going to jump back in here for one more slide too. But oh, I apologize. That's okay. Um, Emily is about the best uh, person that you could ever have to work with on a course like this and I speak very highly of her to everybody. You can see that I think from hearing her talk about things. I want to go over one more slide before Jason does uh, tell you a bit more about the group projects uh, just to amplify a little bit on what Emily said. These are the three projects that the students undertook as a group and this was something that essentially went through the whole course from the beginning to end in various aspects. We wanted to look at PennDOT local bridge conditions. I won't again read all of the bullet points down there but you can see some of the characteristics that the students analyzed, uh, gathered data together, did some analysis, output. The second one is looking at non-motorized vehicular safety issues particularly for uh, Amish buggies, pedestrians and related things here in central Pennsylvania is a significant uh, concern. The third project was to look at PennDOT's RCRS system, the road condition reporting system, with regard to road closures, where they occurred, what kind of frequency, different places. And I put an extra bullet down there about LRS conversion issues because we had a lot of fun going through that and trying to uh, get one location referencing method converted over to PennDOT's main method and Jason may say a couple more things about that. We used Mifflin and Juniata counties essentially as the, the pilot areas uh, or as the test cases for this. That involved CEDACOG and PennDOT District 2 significantly in getting data, manipulating data and looking at the output results. And the sequence of steps for this was a lot of hands-on work looking at data organization, getting it organized through online mechanisms, through FTP sites, for example, doing some status reporting. Jason will tell you a little bit about how often the students met and what they talked about and how they did that. They were required to put a, essentially a project plan together. After the data analysis was uh, conducted, with my involvement throughout this whole process, certainly in a lot of ways, there, was, uh, there were output maps that were produced. Um, including story maps that you'll see in a minute again. There was what I call the digging deeper aspect of the three projects where uh, students picked one of the projects each and did a, a research paper on the exact same um, aspect of what they worked on but someplace else in another state, for example. One um, instance of that was the non-motorized vehicular safety issues. There have been some other states that have been very heavily involved in planning for that. Ohio is one notable example and they were encouraged to look at those and also see how GIS either supported those or, or could, could support those as time went on. Emily mentioned the final report. We wanted to also make sure that the students had the opportunity to not only summarize what they did but to provide some additional information about what else could be done in the future to build upon what they did. What could be of value to PennDOT and CEDACOG particularly 
uh, in taking these analyses and taking them up another step. So I think one of the, the legacies of this particular uh, class this time will be taking the information that they started with and as Emily mentioned that it's got legs to it, that it will be continue to develop and continue to be built upon and we're very happy and excited about that. So I will uh, let Jason jump in here and talk to you a little bit more about the group project and some of his observations and to show you some of the examples that came out of that. All right, good morning everybody. Uh, again, my name is Jason Hollister and I was a student in uh, the GIST course this past semester, but I'm also a transportation GIS specialist with Northeastern Pennsylvania Alliance based in Pittston, Pennsylvania. Uh, so as Don touched on, uh, there were three real world group projects as part of the coursework uh, this past semester. And you saw the summaries on the previous slide that he covered of the three different subject areas and the study area that we focused on. But basically, uh, these projects were as real world as they could get. Uh, we, were, we were given project descriptions and summary sheets. And we were responsible as a group of, uh, there were six of us in the course, of uh, every aspect of the projects, from project management down to actually completing the tasks and providing the, the written feedback and the final products as well. Uh, next slide. So our first task to uh, decide upon was how we were going to collaborate. Uh, we were spread across the country. The students were from Virginia uh, over through Washington State on the West Coast. So we had to come up with meeting times that we could all collaborate at the same time, and we also had to pick a platform. Uh, it was a little bit of trial and error, but we finally settled on utilizing Google's platform. It was user-friendly, and it was also mobile-friendly, which was important. Um, I think at some point during the past semester, every single class member was uh, required to travel for their job, and uh, so being able to have that mobile-friendly aspect to still communicate with the group was important. Uh, we utilized the Google Drive to post documents and collaboratively edit a single document on the Google Drive. And again, we, we utilized the Google Chat feature. So there were three group projects. The first one we approached, uh, all six of us as a group, and then for um, time's sake and uh, to be more efficient, we actually broke the group of six down into two groups of three and we each uh, conquered one of the remaining two projects in that manner. It was a little bit easier to uh, manage the tasks that were required with, with only three people as opposed to six, and, uh, and we found that, that, prog that process worked well for us. And overall, basically, again, we were, the, we were able to assign our own deadlines within the tasks themselves. We had to have the project completed, obviously, by the end of the course, and that was really the only deadline that was provided by Don. The rest of the work was done uh, on our own schedules, and it provided flexibility, which everyone appreciated throughout the course. Next slide, please. I'm going to walk you through some of the example map outputs now that the group came up with. This one was specifically for the local bridge project. And it highlights emergency vehicle bridge restrictions based on, based on the posted weight restrictions. And uh, this sort of information would be important to the local emergency response personnel uh, so that they could see which bridges could and could not support the weight of, in this case, we're looking at fire trucks here. Next slide, please. This map output uh, highlights scour ratings and structural deficiency ratings on local bridges. And this was something that after speaking uh, with some personnel at CEDACOG that was never actually combined onto one map before in this region. So uh, they had a list and maps of bridges that were structurally deficient, and they had maps of bridges with their scour ratings, but they were never overlaid and compared to one another. So. That, this is one of the outputs that the group was able to provide back for CEDACOG's benefit. Next slide. 
So this is basically our final recommendation on the local bridge project. Uh, this combined all the different rating and rankings uh, for bridge conditions into one map and we highlighted the top 10 bridges that we felt should receive priority when budgeting for repair and replacement in that region. Next slide. This is a screenshot from the non-motorized project which was analyzing the placement and location of rumble strips uh, throughout the same two county region. And this was actually the one project that I was not involved with. So um, that's just a screenshot from, from that. Next slide, please. And this is a screenshot from what I think everyone would agree was our most challenging uh, project. It was the RCRS uh, road closure uh, data that we attempted to linear reference over the state network. And uh, this is a screenshot from that. Uh, it, was, it was a sticking point that had uh, everybody that was involved kind of scratching our heads, if you will. Um, it, we, we asked Don and uh, CETACOG and even PennDOT got involved to some, uh, to some extent in trying to troubleshoot this for us. But uh, we did make some headway and uh, PennDOT is working on a tool that's actually going to address a lot of the stumbling blocks that we hit during this uh, specific project. Next slide. So we created a story map for our, the local bridge project, which uh, all six group members did work on. There's a link to it right there, so you'll be able to go ahead and, and visit that. It is a live application, and it's something that CETACOG is going to continue to develop. Um, even now that the course is over. So we basically um, compiled all of our results and the analysis that we did on the local bridge project and included the real world recommendations as well. And again, that's going to benefit both CETACOG and PennDOT. Next slide, please. We utilized the TABS story map theme from ESRI and we broke down the different rating and condition factors, uh, one tab for each, and then uh, compiled the final tab, which has all of our recommendations. So this is a shot of the first tab, and it was just an overview map, and it, it showed the location of all the local bridges in the study area that were greater than 20 feet in length in the two counties. Next slide. And this was the tab that we focus on the posting status, uh, the bridges that did have posted weight limits, and um, so that allowed the users to view just that specific subject. Next slide. And this tab focused on the scour ratings, which um, deals with flooding events. So if anyone was interested in just that rating criteria, they could view it on this tab. Next slide. And we skipped a few in between here, but again, this was the last tab that, uh, again, reported those same 10 recommendations for repair or replacement priority. And overall, I think the story map application is uh, more interactive and fun to look at than a, a regular static paper or PDF map. So this allows the user to, to click around and find out more information than you could convey on a, on a piece of paper. Next slide. So basically to summarize the project outcomes, um, obviously we had the story map application that we just saw a few screenshots of and the map outputs that uh, benefit both CETACOG and PennDOT. And we were able to produce and document um, recommendations on ways to improve the data quality or usefulness of the data that we did work with through these projects. And we also establish a working relationship between neighboring MPOs, uh, between CETACOG and then my organization, NEPA Alliance. Um, and basically that's a relationship that's going to continue into the future um, with sharing of ideas and data. There's really no need to reinvent the wheel. So uh, that was a valuable connection that was made through this course. And overall, it was a meaningful educational experience for everyone that was involved. 
Um, it provided enough GIS exposure for beginners, people that might not have been experienced uh, as much with the software, but it also provided more challenging tasks such as the RCRS and LRS conversion issue that we faced in the in the one specific sub project. So that was uh, definitely a challenge for those of us that were even more advanced users. So overall, I think it was a great experience for everyone. And I'll turn it back over to Don now to wrap up. Thanks, Jason. Um, I'd like to point out too that uh, Jason was essentially elected by his peers to be the foreman of the group to keep things going as uh, what was comparable to being the project manager and he did a great job. I think he uh, did a, a wonderful job of moving things along and keeping people in the fold so to speak to make sure that there were valuable results from the projects. So what did we all learn about engaged scholarship this time? Just a few bullet points I thought I would point out to summarize here. The guest experts were very much engaged. Uh, they told me and gave me some feedback afterward how much they enjoyed the process and really felt that it, it went quite well. They learned from the students as well as the students learning from them. And the, the focus on practical applications and experience really drove that, I think. The virtual field trips also emphasized the real world aspects of GIST. Pretty much no matter where anybody lives, there is a, uh, there's an opportunity to find an agency that's using GIS in some transportation related way. And it was important to facilitate the sharing of those experiences. So we were able to do that through videos especially. Um, I'm going to skip down to the next to last slide about the hands-on projects. Uh, I want to point out again that that had added value because they were supplemented, which is why we added in the idea of the digging deeper paper later on. That wasn't something we were planning for right at the beginning, but I think that worked out very well. It helped the students draw parallels to what they were doing in the Pennsylvania experience with some other states also. The last two slides, the inventing as you go and the bottom one, use of collaborative tools. Um, this can be difficult, but I think it was very worthwhile to approach things these ways where real world projects particularly can be difficult to accomplish. As Jason mentioned, the projects were run for the most part as if you were a group of consultants or a group of project people in an agency running and implementing a project with all the attendant difficulties and barriers to overcome and collaboration. My own experience in working in consulting for 20 years is it mirrored a lot of how projects do go, especially when people are scattered around the country or your client might be a thousand miles away. The peer collaboration is really the key to making that happen and I think they did a really good job of that from a distance. Um, it wasn't always easy, but the, the final results I think bore out that they did a, a particularly effective job at collaborating. But the tools aren't foolproof either. There are many different ways to approach this, different uh, solutions for collaborating. I think we learned much this time about what works best and what doesn't and maybe we'll have some things to offer that might offer an improved experience the, the next time around uh, for supporting some of this work from a distance. So I hope we uh, offered you some interesting discussion today. Uh, my thought about the, the course itself and how it's continues to evolve is that it's been very worthwhile and I hope it has offered a very worthwhile experience to the students going through it. I know it's offered us involved in the course development um, a lot of uh, fun experiences and invigorating experiences in developing it. There's a lot of flexibility built into what can be featured in the course. It's a constantly evolving thing which offers its own challenges but I've enjoyed it a whole lot to this point so far. I think Emily has as well. And um, we intend to keep the, the course uh, moving along through time. So there's our contact information. If any of you would like to get a hold of us directly, we'd all be very happy to follow up with you as needed. And I think with that, I'll step down here and the floor can be open for comments or questions. We're very interested in your feedback and ideas or comments that you have to try to make the course better as uh, the next uh, versions of things will come out.
Thank you, Don, Emily, and Jason. That was very informative um, and, and exciting to see. Um, and to the audience, uh, I, I've tried to remind you, but there's a um, window right to your uh, to your right that says questions, and you can type your questions or suggestions in there, and I'll pass them along to the presenters. Um, while we're waiting for people to find that and type that in, I actually have a question uh, that may be on people's minds. Um, if you, if a transportation agency wanted to collaborate with your students and your um, it, going forward, how would they best go about it? What type of information would they need to um, sort of provide or or give you to sort of get started with that? I think the the key to it is defining, as, as we saw with this latest version of the course, designing what an appropriate scope is. And that was perhaps the most challenging thing about designing the group projects, is we hadn't been through that before. So questions that come to mind is, are we biting off more than we can chew? Are we offering enough content, enough experience with the students to make it a, a real viable experience in the time constraints that we have and the distance constraints and many other constraints that are there? One thing we tried to do this time was to build these three projects so that if we didn't completely finish one or more of the projects, there would still be value that came out of it. The, the one with the road condition reporting system didn't completely finish, but I think the experience that we went through with that was still a very valuable thing. So for collaborating with any other kind of agencies, I think that would be the most important thing is uh, can something be developed in terms of a scope to be included as a, a real-world hands-on project or projects that fit the nature of what the course has to be? And we know more now than we did before the first uh, uh, run through on projects like this, obviously, but that would be the biggest challenge, I think. Other than that, um, I don't think there's a limitation necessarily on projects that might be suitable except for, you know, do students have access to appropriate technology? Can it be worked out with accessing of data or in other information that they would need? What are the results that would be expected? And does it fit sort of the, the model that we use for uh, diagramming what the results were, maybe writing up a paper and giving some kind of presentation that way? Okay. The next time the course is offered, we might not um, work with the same agencies. We may not work with PennDOT or it may not be with CETACOG, but those were certainly appropriate agencies to start with. So we're very open, I think, at this point on how succeeding versions of the course might treat that subject. But I think we do want to include that going forward. Okay. Well, um, that's uh, really uh, great to, to know that you'll be seeking out other partners. I have a few other questions that have come in during the time. Um, uh, someone's curious about how you've identified the targets to your virtual field trips. Okay. Again, there was flexibility involved there. The first and primary goal, though, was to try to have students find someone in their local area, whether it would be a public agency, a uh, private company, uh, uh, you know, a transit agency, somebody that not only uh, has GIS, but would be able to use it in a transportation setting. One of the students out on the West Coast um, went out to interview a, um, a TriMet group, which is the, the uh, MPO and transit agency in Portland, Oregon. And they did they have done several different things with GIS, so he kind of had things to choose from to emphasize and concentrate on and talk to them a lot about uh, uh, traffic modeling, for example. So I gave guidance to the students and told them if they had difficulty finding an appropriate agency uh, to let me know. I also asked them to run their choice by me so that I would know who it was and what I might know about the agency as appropriate. And I also put together a list of starter topics and questions that they could use to build on um, to start the conversation with the agency because they needed to get that going 
within the first few weeks of the course. Mm -hmm. But other than that, they were they were given a lot of freedom and flexibility to choose, and in a couple of cases, they ended up um, having a second choice, or because they weren't able to get a hold of the the agency in appropriate time, they did go on to a second choice. But no problems overall with that. Okay. Um, someone has asked, uh, what was the class size in the past, and uh, I guess what is the capacity for the class size going forward? Yeah, you heard about this time. The first time we ran it last year, we only had four students in it. Uh, I would like to see more students, particularly from a professional background, from state DOTs or similar agencies in the future. It is a question for discussion about how large we would like the class size to grow. Uh, you know, my idea, I don't, uh, Emily might have an opinion on it too, and certainly others over in the Dutton Institute do. I think if you got more than about 15 students at any one time, it may start to get a bit unwieldy based on the kind of things that we've been having the students work on at this point. But um, we'll have to see how that goes on into the future. Uh, Emily may want to offer a, a comment based on other classes too and other courses and maybe your opinion about what you think. Sure. Um, I guess I would add that uh, in the second iteration of the course, you almost doubled your enrollment, which was great. We got up to seven um, with this second offering of 497C. Um, and that's very typical. When a course first uh, is offered, it often takes several several offerings for the word to get out and for students to realize that it, that it is being offered. Um, so each time that it's offered, the enrollment will pick up. Uh, when we design a course, uh, we do keep enrollment in mind as we're designing the, the projects that are a part of it. So I would agree with Don that in this particular case, the way the course is designed, um, 15, as he said, is a number that we thought would be appropriate. Mm -hmm. um, there are lots of options as far as if responding to demand, um, maybe offering a course more often, um, adding multiple sections. There, there are different um, considerations that um, we could we could consider going forward uh, as enrollment increases, um, and our courses too. Depending on the course, uh, they enrollment varies. Um, many of them are very large enrolling courses. Some are typically much smaller. So across the MGIS and GIS certificate programs, there's wide variance in uh, class size. Okay. Um, I think we have time for one more question. Um, somebody suggested a focus on. Uh, multimodal GIST uh, as an example how to integrate transit, bike, pedestrian, and auto into network analysis. Has that ever, has that been suggested before? Or? Yes it has and even though the, the focus on the course was more on the highway end of things, again for very obvious reasons, that's where the majority of work goes on in the, the GIST world, there was a lot of material in the course on other modes and we had to draw a line essentially again as to where to, how far do we go and cover some of that. We included a lot of material in about transit, we included material in about bicycle, pedestrian, and gave the students the opportunity especially the chance in the application sections of the course where they were doing evaluations of existing applications or uh, write-ups of um, ideas for applications. If that was one particular area of interest, they actually had probably about a dozen different areas that they could choose from, uh, I think a couple of different areas this time, not just in multimodal areas, but in some other uh, certain specific selected areas of um, GIST applications. So while the emphasis was on highways, there is a pretty good multimodal flavor already to the course, but it also leads to maybe another question of, um, you know, if this grows and there's more demand for things, is there an opportunity for spinning off some parts of the course into um, smaller aspects of it, like multimodal versions of that. So that's a very valid question. I think we'll just have to see how things develop over time. Okay. Well, thank you very much, all of you, for your time. And I'm sure that um, you'll get uh, a lot more um, offline. I, I know that I, with all your contact information, I'm sure people will connect, connect to you directly. Um, I thank everyone for their uh, attention and uh, we'll close this webinar unless there's some
um, other thoughts that any of you would like to pose to our audience. Okay. Well, thank you, and um, the webinar is complete. Thank you, everybody. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you.